Okay, let's get started with chapter two. This will be for section one, the introduction. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the production possibility model, we're, and, and we're going to talk about trade and globalization. So the chapter goals is, first, I want you to be able to demonstrate opportunity costs with the production possibilities curve. We'll take a look at that. You'll show how you have to give something up in order to produce more of another good. I want you to discuss the um, increasing marginal opportunity costs that can be demonstrated by the shape of the production possibilities curve. Relate the concept of comparative advantage to the production possibilities curve. We'll talk about that. Comparative advantage is actually a very important topic, particularly in trade. Show how through comparative advantage in trade, a country can consume beyond their production possibilities. All right, this is a little like um, how you can, if you study on your own, you can get a grade of, say, C. But if you use the professor's office hours and you use a tutor, maybe you can get a grade of A. Explain how globalization and outsourcing are part of the global process guided by the law of one price. Yes. The production possibilities model can be presented in both a graph and a table. So let's dive right in and we're going to talk about the production possibilities model. In this lecture, this introductory lecture to chapter two, I'm going to basically throw a lot of concepts at you. Essentially, we're going to be defining terms. So the first term we need to define is the production possibilities model. All right, and to that, the production possibilities table is a list of choices um, that summarize the opportunity cost of each alternative by listing out the amounts of output you can achieve with particular inputs. All right, so let's take a look at that. Um, but first, let's define output and input. What is an input? An input is the raw material or the, the stuff you start with that you use to make the, whatever it is that you're producing. The production that you make, all right, the result of a productive activity, that's your output. So let's take a look at a table. Here we are a student. We're going to take two different classes in a semester. We have history and economics. And you know, based on you know, our, our social life and our work life and all the other demands on our time, we have 20 hours per week to study. So if we spend 20 hours on history, what do we get? 98%, no problem, we pass it with an A. But we spent zero time on economics and we, well, we kind of sort of fail with a 40%, which actually isn't too bad for no time studying whatsoever for economics, but still, we probably want to do better. If we go down a step, we say, okay, what if I want to study a little bit for economics? So I study two hours for economics, but what does that mean? That means I have to study less for history. All right, so to get a higher grade in economics, what do I have to do? I have to be willing to take a lower grade in history. All right, so we see the opportunity cost. In order to the opportunity cost of studying for economics, studying for history. So what's our output? Well, in this case, it's the grade we earn. What's our input? Well, in this case, it's the time we spend studying, all right? And we see there's this trade-off between producing either a history grade or an economics grade. And then we can keep going and we can look down here and we can say, well, what if we spend 10 hours studying history? Well, we get a C. And 10 hours studying economics? Well, we get a C. Um, yeah, so that might be the best we can do. All right, maybe we go down here and we, we can pick the one that we like. We don't really have a way to pick which one is best yet. This just tells us the possibilities and how much we have to give up to do one or the other. Now the production possibilities curve is just like the table, only in graphical form. You know how we like graphs. So yes, graphical representation of the opportunity cost concept. We can see this. We'll take a look at this when we see the graph in just a second. Um, a production possibilities curve is created just simply by taking and plotting the points on the production possibilities table. Okay. So let's plot the points on the production possibilities table we've looked at so far. Now this is a weird production possibilities curve. It won't usually look like this. Um, they won't usually be a straight line. But in this case, it's a straight line. And we can see, well, how does this demonstrate opportunity cost? Well, let's say I want to get 100% in econ. What do I have to do? I have to be able to, w 
to um, accept a 58% in history. So what if I want to get a little better grade in history? Well, I would have to accept a little lower grade in econ. All right? So I have this trade-off. What's the opportunity cost of getting a higher grade in history? The amount lower grade I get in econ. All right, and we have the point there in the middle where we spend 10 hours on each. All right, if we spend a little more time on econ, well, yep, we get a higher grade in econ, but we pay for that with a lower grade in history. So, a couple things. A production possibilities curve demonstrates there's a limit to what you can achieve giving existing institutions, resources, and technology. But you might say, well, wait a minute. I don't want to get a 70 and a 78. I want to get, you know, well, a 90 and a 90. How can I do that? Well, one way that we could do that is we want to play with that curve. We want to try to shift it. One of the things we could do is we'll increase our resources. So, for example, you spend 10 hours on your own in history, 10 hours on your own in economics, you get a 70 and a 78. But if you take two of those hours, and instead of spending them on your own, you spend them with your professor talking about the questions that you have, maybe you become much more effective because you have more resources. You shift this out and you get a better grade in both. The second point is that every choice you make has an opportunity cost. You're all, every time you make a choice, that means you did something, but it also means you did not do something, right? Which means you gave that up, which is opportunity cost. Increasing marginal opportunity cost. Now, here's the bummer. As we go along and produce more and more of something, the opportunity cost of producing that next something goes up. All right, so here's a very classic example. It goes back to Paul Samuelson. It's called the guns and butter example. So we have an economy that's going to produce two goods, guns and butter. Yes, I know. If we're only producing two goods and they're only guns and butter, well, we're going to be really fat, naked people that shoot each other. But that notwithstanding, we're producing guns and butter. And we want to realize one thing. The stuff I need to produce butter is not exactly the same as the stuff I need to produce guns. All right? So if I'm producing up here a lot of butter but not many guns, the slope of this curve is pretty flat. The production possibilities curve is pretty flat, which means I don't have to give up very much butter in order to produce more guns. Right? Because I'm producing lots and lots of butter, and I'm using probably some resources to produce butter that aren't exactly perfect for producing butter. So giving up those resources to use them to produce guns doesn't bother me too much. But if I'm over here, Notice the slope of this curve is pretty steep, which means to produce one more gun, when I'm producing a lot of guns, I'm going to have to give up a lot of butter. Why? Because I'm trying to use resources that are really better suited to producing butter to produce guns, and it just doesn't quite work right. So I have to give up an awful lot of butter production in order to get just one additional gun uh, when I'm over here. What does that say? Well, that means this opportunity cost of producing a gun starts out pretty low, but ends up pretty high. We could flip this around and say the same thing for butter. The opportunity cost of producing butter starts out pretty low and ends up being pretty high. All right. As we produce more and more of a thing, the in marginal opportunity cost of producing the next unit of that thing is almost always going to increase. Ah, so a little bit of why that is. We talk about comparative advantage. In this case, we're going to talk about comparative advantage relative to inputs. All right, so the reason opportunity cost of guns increases as we produce more guns is that some resources, well, they're just better at producing, say, butter than guns. So let's take, for example, a natural resource, a cow. A cow is not very good at producing guns, but Cows can produce milk, and milk is really good for making butter. Okay. So if that's the case, then we end up seeing that, yeah, all right. So a cow is probably a lot better for producing butter than a gun, and so if I try to take 
cow resources and use them to produce guns, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do so well. So cows have a comparative advantage of producing milk as opposed to producing guns. All right, which makes butter. So a resource has comparative advantage if it has the ability to be better suited to the production of one good over another. Yep, pretty much. Ah, uh, next concept. I know, we're just throwing tons and tons of concepts at you this um, lecture. But hold on. Um, efficiency. Oops, sorry. Efficiency. Um, we are productively efficient if, you, if we use our resources to produce as much as we possibly can. All right, so let's take a look here. We've got four different points, and let's see if they're efficient or not. So let's take a look at points A and C. They are on the production possibilities curve. So what does that mean? If I'm producing at point A, then given my level of butter production, can I produce any more guns? Nope, I'm producing the most guns I can given the butter that I'm producing, right? Also, I'm producing the most butter I can given the guns that I'm producing. That's efficient. All right, C. Well, I'm producing as much guns and butter as I possibly can given that combination of inputs and outputs. So if I, the only way I can produce more butter is by producing fewer guns, and the only way I can produce more guns is by producing fewer butter. All right? So both A and C are efficient. Which is better? Answer, I don't know. Right? We'd have to know something about the preferences. Do people prefer butter or do they prefer guns? You know, do they want to clog their arteries or shoot themselves? Hmm, I don't know. Right? Okay, that that's being a little silly, but you get the general idea, right? I don't know which one is better because we don't have society's preference yet. Um, but they are both efficient. Now let's look at two other points. So let's look at point D. I like D. D is great. I get more butter, more guns, except. I cannot produce D. All right, it's unattainable. It's beyond my production possibilities curve, which means I can't produce that much yet. All right, I don't have enough resources. I don't have good enough technology. I just can't hit D. So while D would be wonderful, it's not possible. B is inefficient. Why? Because at this level of gun production, I could produce more butter. All right, not give up any guns, still produce more butter. Or I could not give up any butter and still produce more guns. Or anywhere there. I'm not using all of my resources efficiently. All right, next concept. Efficiency and technological change. So when we have technological change, first of all, let's make sure we know what technology is. Technology to an economist is not a computer, although that could be a part of technology. It's not an iPad. It's not a... Xbox, it's not all of these things that we have that we think of when we think of technology. It is the application of knowledge. Particularly, it's the application of knowledge to making stuff. All right? Think of technology as this big black box. I take my inputs, I put them in the black box, I shake the black box up really good, and then out come outputs. All right? It's the process by which inputs, raw materials, are turned into final goods. Okay, so how do we represent a technological or increase or an improvement in our ability to make stuff? All right, our knowledge on how to make stuff. Improvement in the process. Well, I'm going to show that as a shift in the production possibilities curve. So if it's an increase, it's going to be a shift out. Well, the first one I'm going to show you is kind of weird because it probably never happens exactly this way. Um, there might be a few examples that happen like this a neutral technological increase. All right? That results in basically a parallel shift out. Now I know this is a curve and so it's kind of funky to talk about parallel, but you get the idea. All right? This space kind of stays the same all the way around. All right? It shifts out. All right? But it improves our ability to produce both goods A and B. So both of these goods are improved by um, this technological increase. Okay, so one example, it might be, think of, say, I don't know, the assembly line. 
which actually wasn't neutral to begin with because it basically affected cars at first because that's where it started. But we have lots and lots and lots of products that get produced now on an assembly line. Okay? Um, a biased technological increase. Now this I think is the normal way that things happen. That a technological increase happens and it improves our ability to produce one good more than other goods. So in this case all the production increase happens in good A and none in good B. Now notice that the only point along this production possibilities curve that isn't affected by this technological increase is where we produce all B. Why? Because now it's cheaper to produce A, which means we have more resources left over to produce B. So even a technological increase that's biased and only affects the production of good A might also help us increase the production of good B. Now clearly not quite as much as this one, which was um, neutral, but we still see how technological increase can help us produce more. Distribution and productive efficiency. So one of the problems that we deal with all the time in economics is distribution. And that, and that is this question of who do we produce it for. But the production possibilities curve basically ignores this because we're talking about a macro model which is basically for the most part just fancy averages over everybody. Um, which when you take some kind of an average, no matter how fancy you get, you lose distributional effects. So some of these tools aren't so good for studying distributional effects. Um, so for example, if a method of production changes income distribution, we cannot determine um, if that method is efficient or not. Efficiency has meaning when analyzing a particular goal, so we have different types of efficiency. You probably remember that from um, principles of micro, so for example you might have technical efficiency, are we producing as cheaply as possible? Allocative efficiency, are we producing the right amount of it? Um, but it has meaning when we have it defined in the specific sense. So for society, uh, inside our society most people prefer more or less, many policies have relatively small distribution effects, so Generally, we're okay with this kind of a model. Um, this gives us a start. But it's really important to realize that just because you're productively efficient doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a good system going. You could be producing really, really well, and one person gets all of the income from it. Well, in that case, you have one person living well and there were everybody else starving. That's not good. It's also not sustainable. So that is definitely a, a, a shortcoming of this model. But remember what a model is. A model is simply a simplified um, version of reality that lets us study one particular aspect. And the distributional effects are not the aspect that's being studied here. All right. And if you're interested in further reading, please see the link right here. And we will see you again in section two.